moment. Here we go. Uh, you don't even need that. I think if you just... Whoop. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, just use this to go forward. Okay. Oh, to point. Yeah. It's a little... Oh, yeah. Got it. You see? It's okay. right there. Okay, cool. Thank okay. you. <laughs> All right. Um, I really want to thank uh, Hiram for the wonderful, wonderful talk he gave because it makes my talk much easier to give. He's introducing a lot of the concepts, same, um, many of the same questions in a little bit different system. Um, so, along with, um, can I do this? There we go. Okay. Um, along with my team from Denver, um, the rest of them couldn't come today, and so I'm here to tell you about what we've been doing to try and understand uh, the general uh, program that builds the. Oops. <laughs> okay, back up. There we go. Uh, the general developmental program that builds the face, and um, we are really focusing on um, the uh, morphogenetic. Um, issues between about um, um, 10, E10 and 12 stages of development, where we go from um, little nubbins of the facial processes to something that's really quite recognizable as a face. And um, our project for face space really had three aims. The first one was uh, general transcriptome. Um, um, both larger RNAs and smaller RNAs um, that would be able to characterize transcription um, gene re regulatory networks. Um, also looking at the isoforms, I think Greg gave, um, Harum gave, excuse me, gave an excellent introduction to why this is important and um, that the isoform information is particularly useful for thinking about things like post-transcriptional regulation, um, things like RNA stability and localization, as well as the encoded protein diversity. And then in our third aim, um, we wanted to look at actually the translational efficiency because there's um, quite a bit of difference between what we see in the transcriptome and what we see in the proteins um, that accumulate in cells. And to understand, integrate across all these levels to understand how we, we really make the um, machinery that builds the face. And um, something that we have added to this uh, that I really want to talk about today because it's been really profoundly inspirationally illuminating is some single cell sequencing we've done um, in tissue in the vicinity of, well, I can't point it very well, the lambda junction, so where the upper lip will fuse, the maxillary and nasal processes will fuse together. Um, um, and when that goes wrong, of course, we see cleft lips. So this is, I think, extremely relevant to the mission of face space. Uh, the approach that we've taken broadly is to take uh, tissue from three mouse ages, three facial prominences, uh, microdissect those out, separate them into the ectodermal and mesenchymal components, uh, then extract RNA, and then use that to generate the data sets that we're looking at. Um, and we've talked about this a lot in previous um, iterations of face-based meetings, um, so I just want to say that the transcriptome work, uh, from the, the, like poly-A primed large RNAs from all these different tissues and times, uh, that's all uh, finished analysis. It's um, now up on face space, and um, I think when it goes through the um, updated pipeline, it will be fully released and available to everyone. The second part of this, in addition to the larger RNAs, we're also interested in smaller RNAs, um, micro RNAs, uh, SNOW and SCA RNAs that are involved in uh, mostly RNA um, um, modifications, as well as RNAs that are involved in the translational machinery. And we've also got um, expression data across all these different classes of RNAs and um, now we're just uh, completing the validations of that data. And so um, that's soon to be uh, also released on face space. And so we, uh, that, that transcriptome data across the face during uh, the stages of facial morphogenesis is really uh, fairly complete. Um, 
And so moving on to our second aim, which was the isoform analysis, um, just at one point that I want to make in addition to what Harold was talking about is that really uh, the genes that are regulated by differential expression and the genes that are regulated by isoform differences, um, there's really fairly distinct sets of genes. Uh, this is an example from uh, E11.5 um, uh, maxillary process, mesenchyme versus ectoderm. And um, so it's really important to look at these isoform differences in addition to levels of gene expression. Um, and again, we've been looking at all the various different kinds of isoform differences. So things like uh, differential promoter usage, differential three prime end usage, and uh, exon skipping or alternative exons. And um, like in the suture data, we find that exon skipping is really the dominant form of isoform differences. Um, this is just a heat map where we've amalgamated all the isoform differences, excuse me, <clears throat> across the various data sets. And very much like what he find, we find most of the differences segregate by tissue, ectoderm versus mesenchyme, but we also find a fair amount of um, changes according to age. And I just also wanted to remind myself to mention that we know that these uh, ectoderm versus mesenchyme differences are really important because this splicing factor, ESRP, uh, when you mutate it, you get uh, all kinds of craniofacial defects, including cleft lip. Okay, so this, this data, this analysis, we're uh, fairly close to complete on, and we are in the validation stages of it. Uh, just uh, an example, this gene is the uh, dystona gene, yes, um, which has, we found, whoops. Okay, the dystonin gene, where we found um, different three prime ends that are used um, in ectoderm versus mesenchyme. And this is now uh, in situ hybridization validation showing with the ectoderm specific probe, the ectoderm pattern, and the shared exons, the um, isoforms we see across all tissues. So uh, we're doing this for lots of, lots of genes, and we are particularly focusing um, on some of the novel, unannotated within the uh, current gene models, things that we found. And so that's just what I want to mention here, is that in the process of, um, uh, while processing all of these um, detailed RNA-seq reads, uh, we found lots of alternative kinds of events that are not in the current annotated gene models at Ensemble, but are supported by other databases, um, uh, transcription start sites, polydentylation sites. And so we believe these are actually real, and some of them are used at fairly uh, significant frequencies in the data. And so one of the things that has come out of this unanticipated was that we've actually now got uh, improved gene models um, that we've been able to then use for calculating the statistics on the differential, expression, uh, differential isoform usage. Okay. And so just to summarize this aim, um, we have improved gene models. We have the isoform usage across all of our different conditions. We have uh, uh, genome-wide, I did not mention this, we've done a genome-wide validation of this isoform usage using um, the Affymetrix uh, transcriptome array. Um, and generally, we're finding um, quite reasonable support between the two kinds of analyses um, in terms of exon usage. Um, that we're doing various validations and particularly focusing on the novel things that we've picked up um, in the gene models. And yeah, so this is largely complete and we still have a little bit more of validation in progress. Okay. And then moving on to the third aim, which is the ribosomal profiling to look at translational efficiency. This is something we're really focusing on this year, trying to get this finished up. Uh, it's turned out to be a bit of a technical challenge. Um, the protocols for doing this are not really ideal for small tissue amounts, but we're, we're working hard on that, and hopefully we'll um, have some good progress to show for that within the next few months. So what I wanted to talk about for the remainder of my time is this other um, thing that we have added to our transcriptome analysis with single cell sequencing. And very much like the discussion for the sutures, the logic for it goes 
that there is a lot of cellular diversity, really high resolution fine scale, which is very important for understanding the biology. And so um, um, the biology that I'm particularly talking about here is fusion of the nasal processes um, that goes on between uh, E10.5 and E11.5 um, at a structure that we call the lambdoid junction. And these are just a few quick examples I pulled out of the literature of diversity of gene expression patterns in the vicinity of the fusing lambdoid junction during this time to illustrate that there's really a high granularity of different kinds of cell types and cell interactions that are going on. And if we want to understand the biology of this fusion process, we're going to have to really look in more detail at who these cells are and what they're doing. Okay. And so the approach we, approach we took was, a, a, again, a single cell sequencing where we uh, dissected tissues just from this lambdoid junction of the 11.5, dissociated the cells, did uh, droplet-based sequencing, and um, in a plot of all the different cells we have, uh, where each dot represents a, a transcriptome of a specific cell, and their spatial relationship is based on the similarity of transcriptomes. Um, so within this, we find, again, the cell populations of uh, endothelial cells and blood cells. Um, and then the cells we're interested in, particularly the mesenchymal cells and the epithelial cells. And to really understand what's going in those, we, had, we reclustered the mesenchymal cells and studied those. And then we also reclustered the ectodermal cells and studied those. And I'm only going to give you kind of an overview of some of what we found, but um, the first thing that we found, which I find really astounding as a developmental biologist, is that when we, you know, looked in detail at the cellular types, the clusters of cells that we found, for instance, within the mesenchyme, the clusters, they map anatomically to different subregions within the face. And I had not necessarily anticipated that. I thought they might map to different kinds of distributed cell types, like stem cell types and chondrocyte progenitors. But no, they really map predominantly anatomically. And I found that really astounding. Um, and I have to also say that this is very relevant to Carl and the data structure uh, that FaceSpace is uh, putting together to access things. That, and Yang's, I think, um, insight that the anatomical basis and accessing data through anatomy is going to be really fundamental going forward to being able to work with this stuff. OK, so, and I just, not, not to go to the details, but I want you to particularly look at ALDH1A2, um, which maps to this subcluster down here. And what's really cool about it is that it is expressed specifically in the mesenchyme right underneath where the fusion is happening. OK, so we have pretty high resolution um, um, different cell populations within the mesenchyme. When we go to the ectoderm, we find similar kinds of things, different cell clusters mapping to different regions around the lambdoid junction and the face. And what I particularly want to point out here is these three different cell populations that really seem to be particularly relevant to the fusion process itself. So we have two different clusters mapping to the fusion points, excuse me, respectively uh, laterally between the maxilla and the lateral nasal process and medially um, uh, between the nasal processes themselves. And then we also have the third cell layer, the periderm. And so why do I say these are so important? Well, for one thing, this um, cell group here that maps to the fusing nasal fin, uh, one of our best markers for it, Adam TS9, uh, there's genetic evidence that it's involved in the fusion process. This comes from uh, our own Mary Marizita's analysis, Adam TS9, in a uh, family that had a uh, non syndromic cleft lip. And so, looking more deeply at genes that are involved in uh, lip fusion and result in cleft lip types of phenotypes and how they map onto our data sets, I'm not going to go through what's all of in this, but particularly we find enriched. Um, those genes involved in clefting in the surface ectoderm groups and in the periderm, which suggests that these are the tissues that are perhaps genetically most vulnerable in terms of the fusion process. And so um, going back into the literature a little bit about this and trying to understand the role of periderm, there is really nice data from 
papers that are really hard to find because they are not available online, most of these. And, um, but really nice anatomical data showing that there are periderm populations at the fusion site when fusion is just initiating. There is sort of normal periderm, which is the uh, uh, understood to be a cell layer that overlays the ectoderm and prevents unwanted ectopic adhesions. And then at the site where fusion will initiate, there's a special behavior of these periderm cells, which where they start to extend cellular processes and actually go on to implement the contact and um, initiate the fusion. So in the old literature, there's good evidence that the periderm is important. Uh, we have genetic evidence from the clefting genes that the periderm is important. And putting it all together, um, this is um, some immunofluorescent images we've made where the basal cells here are labeled with um, P63, that the periderm cells are labeled in red with grainy head like three in the nuclei and in green with clawed and three showing the um, cell, cell junctions. And we see that before fusion, when the lateral and medial nasal processes are coming together, the periderm cells are indeed um, there at the surface, ready um, to make contact. That when contact actually initiates, there is, um, it is the periderm cells that are making the contact, um, and that there's this chaotic, chaotic events going on that are really difficult to characterize with this kind of technology. And I just want to contrast what's going on there with what we see Oops, I am not very coordinated. Okay, um, with sort of more normal epithelial structures away from the fusion site, where we have a very nice epithelial bilayer of the basal cells labeled with P63 and the periderm cells as a squamous layer overlaying those. So there's very special behavior that happens at the fusion site with the epithelia. And um, we get a lot of clues about what's going on when we start to look at the genes that are specifically expressed in these different cell populations that we found in our clustering. And specifically, I want to talk about a little bit about the signaling molecules. So we have um, the um, normal epithelium away from the fusion site, which is labeled with Wnt9b. We have TGF beta 2, which gets turned on specifically at the cells just ahead of the fusion site, first in the medial nasal process, then in the lateral nasal process, um, and then when contact, um, it's these TGF beta 2 cells that uh, intermingle and eventually form the, um, the nasal fin that will then resolve to um, when the lip fusion is complete. So the point of this is not so much the details of the biology here, but to say that when we take a single cell sequencing approach, we suddenly see an astounding amount of detail in what's going on with the different cell populations. And that this um, is, that we have a huge detail in terms of the genes that are differentially expressed that characterize each cell population from which we can uh, deduce uh, the biology, the transcription factors, the cell communication, the adhesion properties, um, and I think this is, in the future, the kind of data that, that will be really important for understanding the biology of everything that we're looking at. Um, we have a little bit of a model of the um, cell interactions, because I'm a developmental biologist, I care about the cell signaling, um, and that we have sort of in um, most epithelia, we have basal cells overlaid by a periderm. It's highly organized. It's not adhesive. There's signaling between these two cell layers. It maintains periderm in its non-adhesive state. There's also sig Damn. Um, <laughs> signaling to the underlying mesenchyme um, that will promote its, its growth and morphogenesis in an appropriate manner. And then at the fusion zone, we have something really quite different going on. The basal cells have taken on a new character. They have a different set of signaling molecules. They no longer maintain periderm in its um, non-adhesive state. There's also different interactions with the uh, adjacent mesenchyme. And that all of this together is uh, presumably important for the actual biology of the fusion process itself. So that's just kind of a, a quick um, overview of what we've been learning with our single cell sequencing and I am just astounded at the level of detail of information that um, that comes from it and think that this this is data that can be mined from so many different points of view 
um, and it will be a really valuable kind of thing to have on face space. All right, so just to sum up, we have our um, three aims about uh, describing the transcriptome, the isoforms, the um, a translational efficiency, and some higher resolution work with the transcriptome. And uh, we have a few odds and ends of things to finish up in year five um, that I would just like to now acknowledge my team um, who couldn't be here today, Trevor, um, Helen, Ken, and Reen, who has been invaluable in all of our technical support. And with that, I'll take some questions. Okay, Shannon's got a question. Let me get you here. <laughs> Hi, Joan. I had a, a comment and sort of a philosophical question. So my comment was that your, your last section of your talk really beautifully highlights the importance of taking that single cell data and correlating it back to anatomical distribution. So um, I think it's great. And, incredibly useful to do that. So, but my philosophical question is, what, is mesenchyme really a useful term, at least in this context? No, and I'm just wondering, like when you initially clustered all the cells into that category, was it based on something that they have in common or was it just process of elimination because they didn't fall into other categories? So, so I really glossed over how, how we, generated those broad categories. But yes, those mesenchyme cells have lots of gene expression patterns in common, many, many transcription factors that are expressed across all of those cells, um, uh, many other kinds of um, adhesion. Uh, so yes, they, have, they are a very coherent cell type. And I think one of the challenges in thinking about this data is how to deal with this kind of hierarchy of the cell types. And um, whether we think, it, so we classically think about these things as lineages where you have a, a, a general mesenchymal type cell that as it goes through development becomes more and more committed to different kinds of cell types in a kind of a linear hierarchy. Okay, and now since you were saying philosophical, now I'm going to get philosophical. Is it, when we were trying to reconstruct linear hierarchies, at least with the ectodermal data, it really didn't work very well. Because it seems as though the hierarchies are kind of multi-dimensional. And that you, you, you start going down a hierarchy with one set of genes defining the lineages, and you get all kinds of things that don't fit. And then you start going down a hierarchy constructed by another set of genes, and it's an equally um, statistically valid hierarchy, but, they don't, but they're, they're in different dimensions. And so I think it's maybe... Um, when we're thinking about this as linear hierarchies, that's not over, overly simplistic. Okay. So, Joe, really nice. When you map these uh, gene expression back to the anatomical side, have you had a chance to test some of the functions of these genes in the fusion process, for example? So we have not yet done any functional characterizations. and. As, as you know, those are long and difficult experiments. Um, I mean, the, the few places where there are already uh, mutant phenotypes available, um, so the, the, the genes that are involved in, in clefting in, in the human, that's, of course, a, a very rich resource. Um, and, but no, we haven't really started any of that. Oh, come in. Um. Do you know if anybody is doing um, like an ontology of anatomy? When you showed the expression, it's just, it's in the maxillary process, but the left side of the anterior part, when we remap it back, <laughs> um, is anybody trying to So this, this is something that we've been really struggling with in trying to f come up with a really, a, a, a simple and accurate way of describing what we're seeing. And... Uh, the ontologies and the anatomical terms even, and axes that we have right now are almost not quite sufficiently um, uh, granular and sophisticated to work with this. And so that's something that um, I think we as either generating the data and as a community are going to need to really develop much more, um, much better. 
Any other questions? Yes, hold on. I know Jim is salivating now because there are new terms to come up with, right? But wouldn't it be better at this point, instead of defining the left interior <laughs> off to the side, uh, upside down, uh, defining anatomical terms in and ter the anatomical regions in terms of time and gene expression. This is the E18.5, you know, in this case E9.5, uh, Wnt5 expressing region or something like that, because there's not going to be a function, a, a physical thing you're going to see there, at, at, unless you're really doing ultrastructure that will allow you to define that. And it's going to change probably once an hour. So yes, yes and yes and no. So uh, yes, everything is changing dynamically across time. And I, I think to try and describe it as the upper left quadrant of the, is, is going to be just ridiculous. Um, and, but the problem is that each, almost every gene has a slightly different domain. And so, how to represent this is, I think, a, a significant challenge. Is there going to be some minimal number of genes you can use to roughly define a region? And is it necessary to define the region at that level of resolution if it's dynamic? So I, I think maybe, I hadn't thought about this very deeply, but that at, at the level of the clusters that we generate here might be the right kind of level of granularity to deal with. And anybody who wants to uh, drill down deeper, they just have to grab the data themselves and work with it. Um. Okay. Thanks. Oh. I mean, this reminds me of when we first called a disorder by a syndrome, and then we found the gene, and now we know there are multiple genes that modify the phenotype and the variability. So the same thing's going to happen. We're going to be using our GPS and calling it by some sort of expression profile in the future, each cell type. You're right. I had a few comments. It's, uh, this uh, whole issue of the gene expression defining anatomy by gene expression seems similar to defining brain regions by uh, functional activation, and, uh, fMRI activation, they're, they're always having this issue because you can't see them on a microscope, but you can see them in uh, fMRI, for example. So it seems similar, gene expression versus morphological anatomy. That's one thing. The other thing is in the, this ontology, the OCDM, there is way, way more detail right now than you can see on the hub. I mean, I'll, I'll, I was going to say that in my talk, that there's, I don't know how many, there's about 100 or so terms in there. And, and then it's, we might still have thousands of terms, that, and we can add them because we have a framework. The problem, I think, that um, uh, was being raised earlier, uh, Carl was raising, is that there's a trade-off between having so many terms and, and making unusable the interface. So uh, that's a problem. So, but we, the terms are there, and they can be easily added. It's just how do you make a good user interface to let them be added. Yeah, I think it's pretty clear that a hierarchic, hierarchical kind of structure is, is essential for this. And exactly how that um, um, in detail. The devil is in the details. Okay, any other questions? But, um, I also think ultimately we really need to pay attention to the function of these genes because that will help to uh, determine you know, this particular uh, group of cells at this anatomical lo location, what collectively, what do they do? and then uh, how can they control the developmental process. I think that tied together with the gene expression and then mapped to, back to anatomy, it will really be useful. 